I keep thinking about what is forever to remain the priority. What do you suppose it is if you could just over, not trying to oversimplify it, but surely find something that is a total, complete, absolute, that must remain a mainstay. Whether you're five or 50 or eight or 80, that it must forever remain the passion of all of us that sit in this room. Is there one thing that we could get a handle on that is not subject to change? Here it is. The one occurrence that causes heaven to rejoice. This particular statement is mentioned here and in no other way do we discover anything of greater priority and of greater importance that he places upon them. Here is that one event that causes heaven to rejoice. Is it building a great edifice? Is it how large do our ministries get? Is it TV preachers and how uh, great and mighty their ministries can become? Is it where we are on the social ladder? Is it how much money that we may have stored in our bank account? What is it? What's the one event that can even take place in this room Today that will cause celebration in heaven. These words are important. These words says it all. And here's what it talks about. Jesus said that there is something that's going to take place in heaven. Verse 10, Luke chapter 16, uh, 15, he says it this way. I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents, over just one. Then there's another verse of scripture that I want to read for your hearing today that really captures our attention. John chapter 4 verse 35. Do not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white and they're ready for harvest. So today of all the things that we could say that are important, I suggest to you that First Assembly planted in the middle of this county called Lee, that there is still one priority that must forever remain a constant. And that is of all the teachings and all the ministries that we hold near and dear and place importance upon, still the priority of heaven and the mission of our Savior will be when the loss at any cost. Your pastor, as we speak, and a number of people from the church are in the beautiful Holy Land. There is a mighty river that flows throughout Israel. And that river is known as the Jordan. Now, the Jordan River flows into two seas, two tributaries that it empties itself into. One of these seas, children play on the banks of that river. One of these seas, uh, no one plays there. One of these seas gives off an aroma of life and you hear children play and fishermen fish. In fact, Peter would fish there and Jesus would speak to his disciples and say, You may have teared all night, but go ahead and cast your nets on the other side. But on that other sea where the Jordan empties, no one fishes there. 
One sea there is life and the other sea there is death. One sea is called the Sea of Galilee where there's life. And the other sea there is no life and it's appropriately called the Dead Sea. And therein is an example of what happens to many churches. The Spirit of God had plans. And if you read history, you'll discover that even the Dead Sea once had a history of life. But what they discovered is that when those, when those seas then have no outlet and everything flows in but nothing flows out, everything becomes contaminated and it becomes self-serving. But the legacy of that sea is it's dead. Which tells me that even the Spirit of God can begin and flow into people's lives. But unless the person who receives, unless the person that becomes a tributary of the Spirit of God that flows in, unless what we take in is given out, it stagnates and it dies. I'm here to tell you it isn't enough in America or any other place in the world for that matter for us to build great edifices and maybe have a who's who on the social list attending our churches. That's a good thing, but that's not enough. We may build edifice with beautiful carpets and beautiful comforts and so on, but I'm here to tell you that can only become a dead place. Unless that we understand that all of us in this room have a mission far beyond that that causes us to be some narcissistic, self-serving human being that takes everything in from the spirit world, never to give anything out because there and there alone it becomes a disgust and a disgrace to Almighty God. But let me quickly shift into the present and say the thing that I appreciate, First Assembly in Fort Myers, Florida, that you have a legacy and a reputation that everything that comes in here, you have one goal and that goal is that you understand the mission of why you take up space on this planet we have a mission and that mission is that we are not isolated into some social club that we've become social some social activity that is for me mine and ours but we have been left in the middle of this planet to put the devil's business out of circulation. We have been left to reach the lost and the dying for Jesus Christ. And I must direct this comment to you young feisty hair dude kids. Where is that Zane guy? I didn't see you call. Where is Zane? Did you call his name while ago? Did you see that hairdo that guy has? You know, y'all, somebody come, why don't you cut your hair, boy? Because they did that to me. When I started out, didn't they zone out on that? Come up and that hair, mine was just a little bit longer and I had a little more of it in those days. But the, a few pastors say to me, boy, what you letting your hair grow like that for? Everybody had an opinion. But you know what I noticed in about two seconds, I got past all of that and all of that. You know what I noticed? I notice that these young champions, they're on fire for God. And they're going to reach a generation that'll never listen to me. They won't listen to a guy in a, in a suit and a, uh, and a tie and all of that. But they're going to listen to that Zane guy. And he'll walk in there under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you something. If I had my way about it, I'd take all hundred of you and stick you on an airplane and turn you loose on some of these congregations I have to preach. And I wouldn't even have to preach. I'd just turn old Zane loose and I'd just let him begin to sing under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And people will come to Jesus. And let me tell you, don't you let anybody rain on your parade. Man. I've had that bottled up for two days. I needed to get that. Had to get that out. 
I've been at it a little bit longer than some of you kids uh, 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 by a lot, but I can tell you after 44 years, I feel on fire. I've never been more excited about preaching the gospel. Somebody said, well, when you've been it in your long term, you kind of get dead. Not this cowboy. I don't ever intend to get dead. I get up every day of my life saying, devil, are you up? I'm ready to put your lights out in the name of Jesus. Our young people have a right. They don't have only a right to hear about what God has done. They have a right to see the demonstration of the power for our generation. Don't make me come down there. What makes heaven rejoice? What's the legacy we're going to leave behind? Well, let's see. Jim Anderson. Everybody say Jim Anderson. He and his brother Charles, great missionaries around the world. Assemblies of God, love, respected. And years ago, I heard him tell this story. He came home from the mission field. Jim did. He had lost one arm. In some accident, I really don't recall But in any event, he had lost that arm and he was in the state of Kansas and he was driving through Kansas and he, he, he became uh, conscious of something that caught his attention. It was harvest time in the state of Kansas and he had preached that morning in one church. He got in his car. He was heading to another church and he was driving across down the roads and, and the beautiful wheat fields of Kansas and it was blowing in the wind like this. And Jim Anderson said it was a beautiful harvest and it was a beautiful sight. He said, in the distance, I picked up, I picked up this sight that just caught my attention driving. And he said, I noticed the combine on Sunday afternoon kicking up dust, working on Sunday. He said, then next to that combine was another right next to it and then and then another and then another and as he got closer he said I noticed that trail of dust just went out of sight and he said I never saw a sight like that it was combine after combine all in the same field same field and he said as I got closer he said I could see them clearly and he said they were all in that field many 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 combines side by side. He said, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said, pull over, wave one of them down and ask them why they're working on Sunday and why so many combines in the same field. So they were cutting a big swarth and they were coming along like this. And Jim Anderson said, I got out and I waved one of them down and he stopped that big machine and came down off of that and it was a big burly farmer and he had wheat dust on his face and he was wiping it and walked over and he said sir are you in trouble can I help you he said well he, well, he said I don't I don't know how to say this but he said I'm a I'm a missionary and the spirit of God spoke to me and told me to pull over and ask you what are you doing out here working on Sunday since I know farmers believe in God and you're always in the house of God. He said, well, we always go to the house of God. But he said, he said, late last night, we got word from the weather bureau. And the weather bureau said that there's a storm that's going to come across these plains. And this harvest is going to be lost because they tell us that there is large hail in this storm. So before day- daylight, we met at the, at the town square and had a meeting. My neighbors and I, and we uh, got together. And when we got together, we prayed and we asked God to direct us on how and what we can do to save as much of the harvest before the storm comes. What can we do? And he said, we concluded that we can do 
more together than we can apart. All right, that's pitiful. I'm, I'm ashamed of you. We're going to have to do it better than that. Now watch this. He said, we can do more together than we can apart. I wonder what would happen in America. This is a footnote. Don't take it out of my sermon time. This is a footnote. I just wonder what would happen in America if all of the TV preachers would say, we don't care who gets the credit. We don't care who gets their name biggest in lights. All we care about, what can we do by getting together and putting our resources together and not care who gets the credit? I got good news for you. There are no stars. There's only one star. He's the bride and the morning star. There are no other but the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I wonder what would happen if all of us just humbled ourselves before God and said we don't care. Our egos are not at stake here. All we want to do, what can we do to win the loss of Jesus Christ? No, don't kiss up to me now. Forget that. It's just a matter of saying, I want a legacy that has to do when I stand before God. And I am asked, what did you do about the loss? And Jim Anderson said when he said that, we can do more together. And our neighbors decided, then let's put them all in one field side by side. And we will get as much harvest in before the storm hits. And about that time, Jim Anderson said, he said he heard the rumbling of the thunder in the distance and turned and looked and this ominous crowd began to come this direction. And Jim said, I can remember that as if it were clear as yesterday. And he said, it made chill bumps go up and down my arm like that. And he said, I heard that farmer say, Mr. I don't need to be rude. But he said, there's a storm coming, and I have got a harvest to save. How many of you believe that we are living in one of the most ominous, uncertain times in the history of mankind? And the church must get back to priority. And the priority is that we all get on the same page. We all pile our resources together. And we get together and we begin to say, what can we do to save the harvest before the storm hits? Jim Anderson said, I got in that car and I began to drive. And he said, as I was driving, he said, I looked in the rearview mirror. And I kept an eye upon them and the dust was kicking up and he said they got smaller and smaller but he said I begin to weep and the spirit of God began to say to me there's a storm coming Jim and I'm not talking about this one I'm talking about one that's even greater than this and it's coming upon America it's coming upon the world and too many are blinded to the harvest they're so busy on the outs inside taking care of things that really don't have that much importance when the harvest is being lost on the outside and he said about that time I drop of rain splattered against that windshield then he said I heard ping ping as the hail began to hit that windshield so hard it began to like crack it and he said now I had lost sight of the harvesters and all I could do is pull over and he said, I hung over the steering wheel of that car with the tears flowing down my face, hearing the voice of God say, tell the people of this generation, wake up. 
there's a storm that's coming and we had better get the harvest in while there is still time how many of you want to be a harvester how many want to be able to stand before God and say I gave everything to reach the lost Shortly after 1900, we're all familiar with the story of the great ship Titanic. It was said of the Titanic that it was the greatest, most innovative, innovative, safe, indestructible ship that had ever sailed the seas of the world. With a lot of a lot of celebration, it made its maiden voyage. Over 1,400 people, it is said, were traveling on that great ship. But what they didn't know, that there was an iceberg, and even though it appears warnings had been made, somebody somebody somewhere had ignored the warning. And it hit that iceberg. And in a short period of time, that ship went down. SOS signals went all over the place. They loaded the lifeboats to save as many as possible, but as we know through history, there were not enough. It's another subject, but I just want to say we may think this nation is indestructible. But Scripture says the soul that sinneth shall die and the wicked shall be turned into hell, and so will all the nations that forget God. America better hang on to Israel. I said America better hang on to Israel as its protector. I don't care of the political pressure to isolate Israel and for us not to be such good buddies with Israel. Because I'm here to tell you, you're, you're looking at a man that knows exactly what scripture says. Anyone that keeps and works for the peace of Israel and protects protects that nation and blesses it. God said, I will bless the people that are guardians over the apple of my eye, which is the nation of Israel. And anyone that curses it or lifts a hand against Israel, I will curse it. I bless Israel today in the name of Jesus Christ. So when that ship went down, It had a passenger on there that the story would get out. His name was Harper, John Harper, and he was the pastor in Chicago. In fact, he pastored a church that's well known called Moody Bible Church. And John Harper, of all the things that he was as a pastor, he was known in that city as the great, compassionate soul winner. He didn't only fill a pulpit. He wasn't only known for his great eloquence and dynamic preaching, but he said, the thing I loved the most was when I left my pulpit and got out among the people, I could not be silent. I had to talk about the love of God. So he was a soul winner. It wasn't unusual to see him on the streets of Chicago with people kneeling around him right on street corners giving their life to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And so John Harper was on this ship and he was journeying with a a companion minister there by the name of Dr. Riley. And he and Dr. Riley were making this maiden voyage on the Titanic. And when that ship went down, uh, his number was called and they were on the deck. And the story goes that while they were on the deck, Dr. Riley, uh, in his own testimony, would come up and say to uh, John Harper, said, you come now, we have to go. We, We need to go. And John Riley, I'm sorry, uh, John Harper said to Dr. Riley, he said, you go on without me, I'll I'll get another one. I'm busy right now, I've I've got to win people to Jesus Christ. I don't know how that settles in your spirit, but it, it does something to me and I keep wanting to reach over here to these champions. It's gonna go forth, don't you let anybody Take away that passion you have for the lost and the dying. Because that's priority. That must be 
your legacy. And Dr. Riley tried to admonish him and he said, but you don't understand. You don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand that this is the only one we can get on and you must come now. And finally he said, uh, uh, John Harper said, uh, so be it. God will take care of me. But you go on and take uh, those that are with us and get on the boat and go on your way. And so uh, Dr. Riley said, I witnessed my pastor as that boat was being lowered, I, the last glimpse that I caught of John Harper was he was on the deck of the Titanic. And some of the people that work on the ship, like cooks and, and people that wash things and people that were the service people, had gathered around John Harper. <laughs> and they were kneeling and he said, I saw my pastor standing with his Bible in his hand and those on that deck were kneeling and I knew what he was doing. He was winning them to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said at the memorial service later, the last time I saw your pastor and mine, he said to the Moody congregation, was he had his Bible open winning others to Jesus Christ. Well, this was like taking place at the memorial service that they had weeks and months later. And during that service, the place was jammed and packed and people were as many on the outside as they were on the inside. The city had turned out. People knew that this is a man that preached what he believed, but he believed what he preached. He didn't only talk the walk, he walked the talk. I want to give you a little extra push today that the only thing about Christianity is not contained with our, with our performance and behavior within the walls of this uh, beautiful edifice today. But I must tell you, anybody can raise their hand in here. It's not difficult for me to shout hallelujah uh, when the Master's Commission Choir were singing. It's not difficult when I get in the company of believers like here at First Assembly and all of you constituents of the believers in the walk with God. It's not difficult to muster a praise when I see your hands raised. It's not difficult to preach in an environment like this. But I must say, it doesn't stop here. And when you walk outside of these buildings, this is where the mission field is. I like what it says at, for, at, for, at the uh, Prestonwood Baptist Church. When you walk out of that building, it says you are now entering the mission field. I'm here to tell you, when you walk out, you become the ambassador for Christ. You become the voice that's crying out. The world may be in chaos, but I have an absolute answer. And his name is Jesus Christ. What a miracle needs is not another denomination it's not another religious organization but this world needs to hear the message of Jesus Christ for he and he alone can save he and he alone That memorial service when all of this is going forth and Dr. Riley is giving that testimony of the last time he saw uh, the Moody Churches, pastor, someone stood up, and that someone had come over from the nation of England. And he said, May I speak? Dr. Riley said, Of course, come forward. And he stood at the podium and he looked at the crowd. He said, I too met your pastor, John Harper. He said, the ship was now gone. We were holding on to life preservers. And the sea was cold and quiet. And he said, out of that darkness, I heard this voice. 
the moon was bright. And I heard this voice say, hello there. Well, that had to be a curious sound. The great Titanic is no more. People are adrift and and out of that moonlight night, a voice that had some uh, bounce to it said, hello there. And he said, I turned, this Englishman did, and I saw a man holding on to something that was adrift. It wasn't a life jacket, but he was just holding on to something. And I looked at him and I said, hello. And, And he said, as we came closer, my name is John Harper. I'm pastor of Moody Bible Church in Chicago, Illinois. And then he said, have you given your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And that Englishman at that memorial service, months later, from that tragedy, responded. He said, no, I have not. And he said, John Harper said to me, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He wasn't saying, why me? And he said, we drifted apart and I saw him no more. And a little bit later on, as the dawn began to break, just beginning to break, I heard this voice again, out of nowhere say, hello there. He said, I turned around and looked and he's drifted back. And he said, The same thing the Englishman said. He said, my name is John Harper. I'm pastor of Moody Bible Church in Chicago, Illinois. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior yet? And the Englishman said, no, not yet. He said, well, it's a good time. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he said... Somehow we drifted apart and I'm holding on to this. And then a third time, a little bit later, I heard this voice one more time. This time, not quite as strong. This time, not quite as exuberant. But he said, hello there uh, again. And he said this time his speech was more laborious. and, And he said... I'm John Harper. I'm pastor of Moody Bible Church in Chicago, Illinois. And he said, have you given your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Yeah. And the Englishman said, I said to him, no, Reverend Harper, not yet. And he said, I witnessed, I saw him as he lost his grip on that floating device that he was clinging to for life. I saw him that the last words out of his mouth were then belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you shall be saved. And he lost his grip and disappeared under the water. He said, I frantically tried to reach him, but to no avail. And now he said, I'm drifting. And that's ringing in my ear. And he said, with two miles of ocean under my feet, a survivor of the Titanic, the last words... I heard a drowning man say, have you given your life to Jesus yet? And he said, with two miles of ocean under my feet, I lifted my voice. And I said, oh God, I want to receive the Savior of John Harper. Forgive me of my sins. I confess you as Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, save me. Amen.
man. And he said, I was rescued that day. And I made up my mind to travel the ocean and come to this memorial service, to this church, and to tell you, I am John Harper's last convert. That the last thing I saw, I saw him cry out to me, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That, he said, is the lasting legacy of your pastor. I've never understood if you'll allow me this liberty to say to you this morning, quite frankly, I have never understood how a person can become chilled or cold or indifferent or dormant in their faith or taking it for granted. I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it how you can forget where you've come from. I don't get it how the body of Christ can forget that we were on a road to a devil's hell. When this man called Jesus reached down his hand and broke the powers of the adversary. Somebody forgot to tell me you're supposed to cool off. Well, I ain't going to cool off. I'm never going to cool off. I'm going to preach it to my dying day that the greatest hope that we have in this world is to tell people about the saving power of Jesus Christ. I ain't chilling out. The problem in America is not a black thing, and it's not a white thing, it's a sin thing. And the answer in America is not a black thing or a white thing, it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Philip said to Nathaniel, come, we have found him. I'm here to tell you there's enough people in this room to turn Fort Myers upside down with the message of Jesus Christ. If 120... No television, no Ford Mustangs, no jet airplanes, no radio, none of the things we have today. If the 120 can walk out of that upper room, changed by the power of God, and then in the next one and one half century, reach the entire known world with the gospel. Shame on us for ignoring the cry of the lost of our next door neighbor. Shame on us for becoming cold and indifferent to the helpless, 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 frantic cries of the lost. The mission field is not only across the ocean, but the mission field is just outside this door. When we stand before God, what will our legacy be? That movie, I don't recommend movies to anybody. I think movies are trash. It's just my point of view. I don't really enjoy paying $8 to go in a theater and watch people do stuff that I get up and try and admonish them not to do. So I don't pay $10 for somebody to use my God's name in vain. That's just me. Wow. That, that, that didn't go over, did it? I think I'll stick to it. I think I'll just keep sticking right there. And anyway, I keep thinking about that one movie that I would recommend called Schindler's List. And at the end of that movie... There's this man by the name of Oscar Schindler, who was a German. 
the only man that's been buried in Israel, the only German to be buried in Israel. Hitler was coming across, killing everybody, killing all the Jews. And Oskar Schindler said, this isn't right. And he began to buy back Jews and save their life and keep them from being killed. And he did it under the pretense that he's working for the Nazi party and that he needed their cheap labor when they were wanting to take them and cart them on off to the ovens and the gas chambers, Schindler bought, brought over a thousand of them, paid his money, and he gave them sanctuary in his factory and kept them busy and kept them working where they couldn't be killed. But the news finally got out what Schindler was doing and the Nazis were sending people now to come after Schindler. And the last scene that stuck in my mind shows Oscar Schindler about to make his escape out of that factory. And those people he saved walked up to him and one would hand him a little flower. The other would come up and touch him and thank him for saving their life. And others would have made a little something with their hand and Maybe it was a little handkerchief and a little something and handed it to them and it shows Oscar Schindler weeping. And he's looking around and they're converging on him, thanking him for saving their life. And now he's about to become the hunted. And he says these words through tear-filled eyes. He felt that gold pin on his lapel and he said, if I had just sold this gold pin, I probably could have bought two or three more and saved their lives. If I, if I had just not worn this uh, pricey of a suit, I, maybe I could have saved one more. If I, if I had just done this, if I had, then he looked at that automobile, that expensive German automobile, even in the, in that time. And he said, if I had just sold this one, I could have bought back several more. If I could have just done more. That's all that was on his lips. It wasn't about now they're about to come and kill me. All he was thinking about was if I had just done a little bit more. And I wonder in the body of Christ across America where the church has finally come to that place to where we don't pay any attention. My house is full, the song says, but my fields are empty. And the lyrics of that song that says, look away from your table, look out through the window pane, just beyond this house of plenty lies a field of open grain. The harvest now is ready, but the laborers, they are few. Get out of the house, cries the Savior, and when the harvest to Jesus Christ. So this morning I conclude by saying when we stand before God I want my legacy to be I want your legacy to be the last thing that we were doing when we were catapulted off of this all of dirt called earth we were winning people to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that must be